Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Swire, the promo guy. My guest today is Julia Boas, event director for Ronak Outside Foundation. Julia and I met through the, for the race medal for Blue Ridge Marathon, also known as America Tevis Road Marathon. Under Julia's leadership, the Blue Ridge Marathon has increased 15% of revenues for the last five years. How are you doing, Julia? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having us. Um, can you please give us a quick bio about yourself and then your role at the foundation? Yeah, so I started at the Roanoke Outside Foundation in about in 2014. So I think like almost seven years. So I'll be starting my seventh year here soon. Um, and I came from a background of um, like outdoor adventure programming. So kind of the outdoor world where I led backpacking programs. And then I ended up being the director for an outdoor program here in Virginia. Um, I used to spend my winters ski bumming it in Colorado, but <laughs> once you get older and more responsibilities, you can't do that quite as much. So, um, so yeah, I started working for the foundation really was a great fit for me. It is covers all of my passions and the things that I care about. And I get to work every single day to make the community that I live in a you know, a better outdoor community that where recreation is just kind of a part of our everyday lives um, to develop those assets as well as the events that we put on. Okay. Um, let's talk about Blue Ridge Marathon. It has been named uh, 10 best marathon here in the country. So uh, can you give us a little bit about the history and how it came up with the name to be uh, America's toughest road marathon? Yeah. So we, when we started out planning the race, this was probably about the first event happened 10 years ago. So we started in 2010. Um, so that was about three years before my time. But the intention of the people who created the race was essentially to, you know, have this sort of showcase event that would draw people to the Roanoke region. So before our organization started, Roanoke really wasn't known as an outdoor town, um, if it was known at all. Like most people had never heard of Roanoke, Virginia. Still people sometimes would be like, you mean like the lost city of Roanoke? And that's in North <laughs> Carolina, so it's not the same. Um, or the, you know, they maybe thought of us as like a train town because the Norfolk Southern headquarters is based here or was. Um, so they just had no idea of what the fact that Roanoke was this beautiful outdoorsy town surrounded by mountains because the city honestly just hadn't dedicated resources or funding or marketing or any of those things to that effort. And so that's kind of why the Roanoke Outside Foundation was started. And so the marathon was actually our very first event. Um, and we knew that, you know, we wanted something that could attract people from all walks of life from all over the country. And so running is kind of one of is like a natural fit for that because people of all ability levels, shapes, sizes, whatever, can come and participate in a 10K half marathon marathon. Um, and so it was, it was an easy way to attract people here. And the America's toughest part, that just kind of happened naturally because as we started planning the course, we wanted to showcase like all the beautiful um, mountains. And so the full marathon actually goes up and down three separate mountains that are all like right near our city. So they start and end in downtown Roanoke and can hit three separate mountains within 26 you know, miles and end up straight back downtown. So that just shows you how we really are nestled in this valley surrounded by mountains. And so once we started doing that, then obviously the elevation profile just kind of skyrocketed. And before we knew it, we had more elevation change than any other road race in the United States. So we thought like, why not make it a thing? Like why not make it a selling point and niche to all those kind of crazy people out there who just can't resist like that challenge and can't resist um, something that has a, a unique moniker about it to say, I tackled America's toughest road race. Um, and so, yeah, it, it just kind of happened naturally from there. We didn't set out with the intention for it to be that hard. It just is the way our terrain is set up. Yeah, I just want to add to that. If you like the scenery so much, then you can actually sign up for the double marathon. You run yeah. it twice. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't start that event or ourselves either people just started doing it they would show up it was this kind of like underground club and they would show up in the middle of the night and run the marathon by themselves and then they would come back to the starting line with everybody else and do it all over again wow. so it started just happening and then we had to do a lot of work because 
the city and other entities, insurance and the Blue Ridge Parkway were not super cool with us making it like a legal thing. <laughs> so it took a couple of years once we decided to make it legit to actually bring it into the fold liability wise and stuff like that. Um, but now we sell out of the mar of the double marathon every year with uh, we have a cap of 150 participants for that race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it was 2018. I was following the race. And then I think that year there was a thunderstorm. So we ended up, ended up the, the race canceled, I think, right in the middle. But then I, I follow a couple of the ultra runners. They didn't care, you know, no support. <laughs> they ended up finishing it. You know, they were all happy and posting on social media. So that, that was kind of fun. And they're the hardcore kind of group. Yeah, yeah. We, we did have to pull the plug a little bit early one time. Luckily, you know, 85, 90% of the runners had already finished at that time. But, you know, the ultra runners, they're the ones who really need the full like seven and a half hours to finish because they've already run a marathon and they're probably walking and stopping a lot. Um, so, yeah, they I mean, they'd been out there for whatever, 14 hours at that point, And they are super hardcore. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to ask on behalf of the runner. So right now it's about mid-December. So are we still on for Bruce Marathon 2021 on April 17th? Yeah, that's the plan as of now. Uh, you know, I think one of the benefits is even though we are a fairly well-known race nationwide and um, kind of a bucket list race, we're a small race. So we, you know, we have between 3,500 to 4,000 runners the last couple of years. Um, that's been our kind of our target. Um, and, and that's against across all the distances. So, so f because we're a little bit smaller, it allows us to do things that are race, like all the other big global ones that are canceling or postponing can't do, you know, you just can't do certain things with 10 or 20,000 people that you can do with, you know, and we may end up having to have some caps on some of the different distances that we don't normally have. So we may end up with only 2,000 or 2,500 runners this year, depending on how we break it down um, by the distance and how we have to space out the corrals and the timing and everything else. Um, but yeah, we are planning to move forward with COVID restrictions in place. And anything else runners should know about and expect you know, to happen in 2021? Yeah, so we actually have a page on our web on our website, like called COVID updates, essentially. And it's a page that we're going to be updating regularly. So we're working with a team of doctors regionally here um, from Carilion, which is kind of like our big uh, medical conglomerate in the area. And one of whom actually also wrote the book for Ironman and Rock and Roll Marathon. So he's their medical consultant. He, all, he just happens to live in Roanoke and he's our medical consultant as well. Um, and so he already wrote, you know, basically a book for them that they used for some of the races that they did back in like July when they were able to have some in person. And they're also planning to move forward with some smaller scale um, events for the spring, too. So he's working with us. And, um, and yeah, sorry, I've got a four year old here. <laughs> OK, I'll help you in just a little bit. But I need to go in the other room. OK, I will after I'm done. I need you to wait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Normally I have dad as backup here, but he's gone right now. So, um, but yeah, so for 2021 on that page, we kind of have a list of the things that we're working on now and like what we're tentatively planning, but that'll obviously just be changing and being mm -hmm. modified as time goes on. Yeah. I know that, you know, other than the bluish marathon, you, you also have a lot of uh, event uh, mass outdoor event for uh, the the foundation. Uh, so wanted to get your take on you know dealing with the pandemic and you know obviously more people more fun sometimes you know you know you gotta have you have concerts too you also have uh, you know uh, mountain bike race and you know people are having a good time in concerts. So how are you guys adjusting to you know what's going on around us and then you know putting on good events. Yeah, so we were able to hold two in-person events this year in 2020. Um, one was a socially distanced benefit concert where people like actually, instead of just getting a ticket, they would get a pod with mm. up to six people in it. And then all the food and beer and everything like that, they would order it from an app on their phone. Um, and the pod, you know, was a lot of them, they could get the option to have it be like decked out with 
um, chairs and coolers and like beer already in it. They all had these like little lights around them and it was super well received and we sold out both nights. Um, granted sellout was still not like a huge amount. I think it was about like 600 people per event or something like that. Um, but it went really well. And through events like that, we've also added in um, like virtual kind of fundraising components. Um, so one of the things that we did was we did a hundred thousand dollar fundraiser um, where basically we worked with some of the corporate sponsors that we already have had um, that, you know, maybe the event that we worked with them on was canceled and things like that. So we were able to pivot their dollars to something that would benefit the community overall. So we, we started a new fund called Project Outside, where outdoor related like businesses and events and projects, things like that could basically get grants from this fund that we created. Um, and so right now we're actually working or taking applications from those organizations to, to get the grant money. But the first step was raising that hundred thousand dollars, which we did all online. Um, it was about probably half the corporate sponsors diverting dollars. So like, I think it ended up being like $65,000 corporate dollars that were diverted from events that couldn't take place. And then the rest of it was just from individual donations that we recruited online. Um, so yeah, that was one positive thing that came out of it. And so now we'll have a hundred thousand dollars, which isn't a ton of money, but we hope it's like kind of a start for something bigger that we're working on with some dedicated funding. Um, but then that money can be used to build river access points, new trails, um, and all kinds of like all kinds of outdoor related things that we've been working on for the last few years, actually getting them done. That's that's amazing because I've also had uh, you know a lot of conversation with other nonprofits. They're they're kind of struggling because normally they will have their poker nights, they'll have their outdoor event, uh, which unfortunately got canceled. So they are uh, finding for race to fundraise. And uh, how did you guys come up with that uh, virtual fundraising idea? Did you guys initiate uh, you know and reach out to the sponsor, or did the sponsor uh, suggested that idea? No, we actually kind of had to create the whole idea pretty well. Um, you know, we had to put together a package and everything and sell it just like you would any other event. So that's kind of the thing about it is that you can't go to them with something that's sort of half thought through. You want to say, like, we have this plan. We have this strategy. We already know where the money is going to go. It's going to benefit the community. It's going to make you look good because it shows that you're doing something for people in a time when they need it. Um, and you know, usually the outdoors is kind, you'd be surprised is a little bit of a hard sell as far as like big dollar donations go, because people are always thinking like cancer or pediatrics or, you know, there's just things that like pull on the heartstrings a little bit more than just the outdoors. Um, but because of the pandemic, people have, I think, really gained a little bit greater appreciation for the fact that we need these outdoor spaces. We need these places to be able to go and recreate because we've all been trapped inside. And so without them, without the trail networks, without the river access points and things like that, then you, you would have had nothing, you know, you would have just had nothing to do and you would have been completely stuck. So, you know, that kind of helped our mission in the short term. Um, but yeah, figuring out what your selling points are and making sure you have a well-presented package to take to the sponsors. Yeah, let's dig deeper. Like, do you research on each sponsor and obviously knowing where, you know, they would take their marketing dollar before reaching out to them? Uh, you know, how are your thought process? You know, you have a couple of uh, title sponsor, which is well, well known, you know, a shoe manufacturer. Uh, so obviously, you know, Energy Bar. Uh, so do they normally tell you what they what they will support or do you really have to do your research and dig through you know these are some of the key points that you know they're going to be interested in yeah and so most of the our biggest sponsors are um, are are a little bit more regional so like you know ultra the things for the marathon people like that they usually do donate things like prizes and so it is a little bit of knowing what people are willing to donate um, but the ones that we went to first for the project outside project are people who are more within our community um, because then they can see that direct result back to them. Um, but then once we started going live with it and saying, hey, these people donated, these people donated, these people donated, it did kind of take on like a little bit snowball effect. So making sure that you're, you know, through social media and marketing and things like that, that you're letting people know that you're fundraising actively and what who all's contributed and what they've contributed. 
um, that allowed some other people who started reaching out to us wanting to contribute as well. Yeah, that's excellent advice, you know, Julia, you know, I think, you know, me, uh, as a marketing and salesperson, I always find out why people would want to buy from us, you know, that's known for us. But I think uh, for nonprofits, sometimes they have to put on a marketing cap, like we, what you just described, and think about the sponsor, the donors, you know, what do they really relate to? You know, what, a, what do they want in return if it's just a, a name brand? So, you know, if you give them the reason and you show them this is, you know, and can make an impact to what you are stand for, or what you're trying to do, you know, there are, there are opportunities out there. And obviously, you know, people are not attending trade shows and other exhibits right now. There are still marketing dollar available to sponsor uh, such events that tie into what they do. Yeah, and so we basically for the for the fundraiser component of it, we tried to build out like a sponsor deck, almost like you would normally for an event. So we built in the fact that we're going to be promoting this and have you know this site, and we're going to be doing all this marketing for the fundraiser through our e newsletter and social media, just like we normally would be, and we'd be doing paid ads and things. And so you know we tried to show them that there'd be a value there. It would be all online for the most part but you know, that they would still get a marketing value out of it. Okay. So let's circle back to Blue Ridge Marathon. I want to ask you for your tips and secrets for growing a race. So how were you able to, uh, you know, go in, look at, you know, what the race will be and develop a uh, growing strategy for the event? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if they're necessarily secrets. I feel like it's just <laughs> kind of, you know, good management of time and of, resources. But um, for the marathon specifically, you know, we really wanted to make sure that it was the community's event and that everyone that lives here feels super involved. So that was actually where we started our efforts is making sure that this is a big deal for everyone that lives here. So just constantly like recruiting people. Um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so re recruiting people from the community. Um, and, and so like one, for example, one thing we do is we actually, all of our volunteer, it takes about seven or 800 volunteers to put on the Blue Ridge Marathon. And most marathons take a ton of people to mm -hmm. put them on. It can be hard to recruit that many people for free. So what we did is we started a charity incentive program where if they commit a certain number of people, like say 25 or 30 people, then they get a donation. They get money directly from the race proceeds to their organization. Um, and so that was an easy way, you know, so now we have hundreds of people and dozens of organizations that have a direct tie to our event and feel that benefit back to them and their organization. And so now they kind of promote it on their behalf and they want to go above and beyond to make their, you know, uh, whether it be like their aid station or whatever it is, extra special. So like one of the things that people say about why they love our event so much is because when you go through the course, there are tons of people just like tailgating out in their yards and having big block parties and, you know, handing people beer and mimosas and food. And those aren't things that we set up or organize. That's just the community feeling like it's important to them. They want people to have an amazing time and want to come back to Roanoke. And so there's people doing all kinds of things like that that are just beyond the scope of what the race itself does. And I think that's the thing that makes people fall in love with the event. That's what makes people want to come back over and over again and feel that like kind of strong emotional tie to what we do. Yeah, that's nice. You make it, uh, you know, a big running party, you know, and runner loves to get back. And I remember in my experience, you know, running uh, one of the ultras that I did is uh, a station. It was out of nowhere and uh, they set out a booth and they actually have rice balls over there. I've never had rice balls in an a station. So uh, it was a fantastic experience. I end up having three rice balls just <laughs> standing there <laughs> and talking to them. So, um, and I know that you guys utilize social media a lot. Do you think that could is one of the things that you know is good for uh, you know a race event to advertise? Oh, like the the stuff that be beyond the race. You mean like the yeah. aid stations and stuff? Yeah, I mean we try to do our best to to promote all that stuff. And the good thing is once you get people like you know your ambassadors or whoever else like 
kind of posting and creating that content on their own, then they start doing the work for you. So they take the picture and they post it to their people and brag about how amazing all the different like aid stations or views or whatever it is that makes your race special. You know, they take over that responsibility for you and do a lot of the work on your behalf, which is kind of the ultimate goal, <laughs> especially when you're a small race like us, who I'm literally the only full time employee. You know, some people have 30 plus people working on their race and can have one person dedicated to social media. Well, I do all the social media and all the newsletters and all the marketing plans and everything else. So, you know, I really need other people to help me do my job. Yeah. And as you know, I, I do talk to a lot of race director and I, you know, uh, work with a lot of different race. So by actually knowing what they're trying to do and knowing their marketing strategy, and especially, you know, I deal with race metal with the way that they approach a race metal, I can kind of tell how they would grow. And then, uh, you know, to tell you the truth with your expertise and details to just doing the race medal. I know that and I've seen that the, the race is, is taking off just by the attention uh, to details that you have on all the elements. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, you know, every single thing that you do impacts your race and medals are a big thing that people care a lot about and they share a lot of pictures of it. And if they look good, then it's free promotions, you know, so that's kind of well, not free because we pay, but although they pay us for them, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's a way that you can promote every single thing you do is something that can promote your race or make a good impression, you know, be that thing that they talk about or tell their friends about. Yeah. Because I, I, I really report, you know, if you're going to start a new race, you have to at least survive three years for it to grow, you know, because you know, for example, you have the race t-shirt, you have the race medal, you have people running it. You can't really build the loyalty, you know, in the first year, you know, and then think about, you know, I suggest people to think about race medal, a race t-shirt is your promotional product that you actually use after the race. Imagine, you know, if you go on to Instagram or Facebook uh, the day after the race, how many runner actually, you know, wear the medal and the t-shirt? And to post yeah, a picture. So they're actually sure. doing, like you said, doing all your marketing for you. You don't even have to spend any money. People are so proud with their medal. They're so proud of the race t-shirt. They're some of them wear it to work, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I yeah. where I live, you know, I live right on the Greenway, which is like a little running, you know, path that's what a 30 plus miles long here in Roanoke. And I see people wearing years and years and years of race shirts. And so, you know, it's nice to see them out there and you can tell which ones are like more popular or who wear, you know, which ones people wear more. And so it's kind of that constant feedback of like what's working and what's not working. <laughs> yeah. It, it's good that you really, you do really pay a lot of uh, attention to details because, you know, some race would think, you know, it's uh, additional expense that, you know, they have to do, but then, you know, from working with you, I know that, you know, this is a lot of details, you know, you want to make it look nice and uh, you know, people are really proud. I, I've, I've, look through all the picture people are so proud uh with things that you know they're receiving their experience so uh, i think bringing a good experience is it was uh, bring people back years after years i yeah and i totally agree and that's why it takes time like you said to build because you're building a relationship with someone and you know that first experience is like wow i never knew roanoke had this stuff and then the next year like another good thing happens and you're building on it year after year and making them have this like positive relationship with what you do. So yeah, it, it definitely takes time and you have to keep that user experience at the core of everything you do. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have a question for you. You have actually touched on a, a lot of the things, you know, so what are some of your favorite strategy for fundraising uh, as a nonprofit? You know, you talk about branding, you talk about marketing, you talk about having uh, your sponsors and, you know, asking volunteers to become an ambassador. Are there anything that you'd like to share uh, to all the nonprofits out there? Well, you know, I think that sometimes nonprofits have unique challenges, different than businesses, but then a lot of times nonprofits have really good opportunities because people oftentimes they want to do something that's for a good cause. So making everything you do be about that bigger, greater picture, you know, beyond yourself um, that's giving back to whatever community it is, you know, whether it be like an actual physical one or one that's, you know, surrounding some sort of 
um, you know, goal or, or disease or whatever it is that people are kind of, you know, rallying around. So, you know, events in years past have been our largest scale way to raise money. So we, we raise the most amount of money through big events. Um, and we have about four large events and then several small events throughout the year. Um, and so, but every single time we have, I'm so sorry. Uh, so every, every time we have one of these events, um, we, we make it about that thing, you know? So like, yes, you're running, but you're running for something bigger than yourself or yes, you're you know, building, we do like a large scale outdoor festival. Well, all the money from that festival, like from the beer sales goes to building trail or from, you know, all the different components, all the races that we do at that festival, each one would have its own like project or goal or um, nonprofit related thing that the money's going to go to. So it gives people like kind of that feel good and the reason to want to participate. So it's like, it's fun to participate and we make it a really good time. That's important too, but also it, you know, makes them feel like they're doing something um, good and bigger than themselves. So that's the benefit of being a nonprofit. Yeah. Thank you so much for information. I, it's coming from you. I know that, you know, you have, spend a lot of time thinking about the marketing, you know, thinking about the why, how, and then before you ever, ever reach out. So, you know, I've, I think this this is an incredible strategy that uh, Julia is sharing here, you know, to help nonprofits. So Julia, if um, people want to find out more about the foundation and especially about Brutish Marathon, where, where should they go to? Yeah, so the foundation is called the Roanoke Outside Foundation. Um, that's at roanokeoutside.com or obviously we're on Instagram and Facebook and all those things. And, you know, maybe that's a good place if you're if you're a nonprofit. I try to always go or really any business, go and find all the other like aspirational nonprofits or related organizations that inspire me and I follow them and see what they're doing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So like I'm constantly looking at what other things that are like me or even bigger than me, like what do I want to work towards? Who do I want to be like? Um, and so sort of keep, you know, following and watching those like-minded organizations um, is definitely something that I do on, on social media and just their website. But, you know, we've got a great website tool as well. Um, that we had people cite many a times is the reason that they moved to Roanoke. So, you know, making sure that your website is actually somewhere that gives people a lot of information that they want. Um, and then the marathon, of course, is blueridgemarathon.com. And we're also on all the various platforms, um, all under Blue Ridge Marathon. I'm pretty sure if you just looked it up. But yeah, we're, we're, we're also planning to have a virtual um, America's Toughest Road Challenge this year, which is new. So even regardless of wherever you live in the country, you could um, try to tackle like an elevation gain kind of uh, challenge for yourself. Nice. Thank you and so get much. A medal. For, uh, and get a medal from Swire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for uh, sharing all, all the tips today. I think they're, they're wonderful. Uh, uh, thanks so much for coming on today, Julia. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it, Swire. Bye.